Day morning, Melbourne, Australia, um, where it is actually not the nicest day here today, but I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of this. And this is Type 1 Connects. It's a learning series, a virtual learning series that is being presented by Ipsomed Canada. And um, we ran half a dozen of these earlier this year in Australia, and I was very lucky to host the events here. And the Ipsomed Canada team kindly asked me to come along and bring my probably weird sounding accent to host these events. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. We will be running these events every fortnight from today through to November. So please do check out the series. We've got some amazing speakers and kicking off with, I think, just an absolutely stellar panel. Um, each session will have a specific topic. Today, we're talking about type one diabetes and exercise. Um, now, I just need to put in a very standard disclaimer that these are all just opinions. These are just our own experiences. Um, please don't consider anything that you hear tonight as medical advice. Go and have a chat with your own healthcare professional. Of course, we do have Gary, who um, you know is a health professional, but um, we're talking generally, obviously. So, as I said, my name is Renza Shibalia. I've lived with type one diabetes for 22 years now. Um, you won't be hearing much from me. I'm just going to be throwing across to all of our amazing speakers, um, who I would love if you could all just introduce yourselves because I've already spoken too much. So Kelsey, Kelsey Heard, I'm going to start with you. Tell us, how long have you had diabetes? And uh, tell us something funny. I don't know. Tell us something that you've done today that's been a bit fun. Oh gosh, work. Um, <laughs> I am a preschool teacher, so it is pretty fun, but uh, I've been diabetic for just over 23 years. Um, I celebrate my diversity on June 25th every year. Um, yeah, I can't really think of anything fun besides work today. So believe it or not, work is fun. Um, That's good. We'll, we'll take anything at the moment as being fun. Um, Shane Foltese, thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us about you and tell us something fun that you've done today. Uh, or not. Oh, <laughs> so hi, my name is Shane. I've been diabetic for 18 years now. And the only thing I really did today was revise notes for school. So that's all I really did. So I can't, it was fun though. That's good. Good to hear. Okay. And Gary Shiner. Now I actually just went to my bookshelf to grab my copy of your book, Think Like a Pancreas. And it's at work, and I haven't been into work for six months, so I haven't actually had your book in my hand for that time. Which I think, yeah, which I think is the longest I have gone without referring to it. I think I just need to order myself another copy, just in case people don't know who you are. Please introduce yourself. Certainly. Well, I've had type one diabetes for thirty five years. Uh, was diagnosed in a town called Sugarland, Texas. Which a lot of people find. Yeah. Out. I've had a, a clinical practice for 25 years, specializing in intensive insulin therapy. So I work primarily with people with type one. Uh, I've got a team of clinicians that all have type one diabetes and we're very into technology and both patient care and communication media and things like that. Uh, I do a lot of writing and lecturing and whatnot. Uh, I'm a bit obsessive about my workouts. I try to get a workout in every day and one form or another. When my kids were little, we'd have dance parties where I would throw them around for an hour. Now they don't want to talk to me, so I do yard work and running and boring things like that. Uh, my, my fun activity today, I mean, I had a mixture of things. I had patients part of the day and various meetings, but one of my meetings was with a group that's developing a consensus paper of best practices on how to utilize do-it-yourself closed-loop systems. So this is so that uh, healthcare providers, uh, especially in, in endocrinology and internal medicine, and also diabetes care specialists, have some sense of, of how these things work and how to guide patients in them. So you know, everyone in this group that's working on the paper uh, is either a user of one of the systems like I am, and you are too, I understand. I am, yes. Uh, so it, th that's fun. I really enjoy uh, getting together with people like that. We're, we have a lot of common interests. Uh, so we all can relate when we say, you know, I couldn't find my Riley link today. We know what that means. Or, you know, my, my sensor bugged out for three hours. We know what that means. Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out, though, what a fortnight is because you described that before. Ooh. Maybe that's a oh. Canadian term. I don't know. But you said so you we do it every fortnight. No, oh, it's every two weeks. 
Honestly, I, so this is a recurring theme for me when I am visiting North America, which I do every year for events and, and holidays and things. And I have friends who um, are keeping a running tally of weird things Renza says. So there's the first one. A fortnight is every two weeks. I'm sorry about that. Okay, thank you for your introduction. Fortnight so, every night. My son's on a <laughs> fortnight on his computer different. every night. Different. Like, we doing this every night? I'm not sure I have any <laughs> until November. We're, we're all going to know each other very well by then. Um, so, by my calculations, we've got 98 years of type 1 diabetes experience on this panel. So, either we're going to know lots or we're going to know absolutely nothing. But I'm going with that's a lot of experience. Now, the way these sessions work best is when they are super interactive. There is a chat function and a Q&A function. You can use either of them, and this is going out to all of our attendees. If you would like to ask a question, but you don't want people to see you asking that question, you can send it just to me. There's a little thing down the bottom, just send it. I think we all know how to use Zoom after all this time, but just in case. Don't send it to all panellists. Don't send it to all panellists and attendees. Just send it to Renza. Um, but if you would like to have conversations, that's absolutely great as well. But these, work, these sessions do work really well when we're um, when we're all working together and answering questions that are relevant to everybody. But I will kick things off by saying that we all have different experiences when it comes to exercise. We all have different ideas about how we feel about exercise. So some love it, some struggle with it. Um, but Kelsey and Shane, let me start with the two of you, if you don't mind. I want to hear about your specific, um, uh, you know, what, what you do every day. What, how does exercise um, fit in your day and I guess also how does it fit in terms of your diabetes management? Kelsey, do you mind if I start with you? Sure. Um, I, well, nowadays I'm not doing much, but um, in not too long ago I was training for a triathlon. Um, most people know it's swimming, biking and running. Um, I always say it's actually a four sport event because of diabetes. Um, you know, you've got you got to think about everything and you, you got to plan everything in advance and um, knowing your body and how it works in the morning opposed to how it works at night or during the day. Um, yeah. So whenever there's, you know, weekends, I'm always out on the bike and um, when I can run when I, when I can run, but our air quality is not the greatest right now. So we're not doing much, but uh, yeah. And then, you know, any spin class and stuff like that. I am on a pump. So that really does help with uh, management and, you know, turning down the basal rates when you need to or planning ahead and um, always having things on you and being prepared for the worst. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It Backup be, plans are so important. It would be fun to have like a diabetic decathlon with events <laughs> like controlling your blood sugar, eating half oh. a pizza or <laughs> have speed trials for changing out your sensor and infusion set. That would be a neat kind of <laughs> Let's do that. I love that idea. Let's do that. <laughs> Shane, let's hear about your experiences. Now, how long have you been using a pump for, Shane? Uh, I've been using a pump for six years now. Okay. So yep. I've tried every single pump on the market. I've bounced around. Currently, I am on the Ypso Med, and I'm liking it. Um, yeah, so, like, when it comes to, like, physical activity, uh, before COVID, I would love to go out to the gym. Obviously, I had to rework what I was doing because of COVID. But um, even when the gym was open, I would be going to the – I would go running every morning. That's how I'd usually start my day, go for an hour. Uh, just with the diabetes side of that, I would – I would reduce my um, basils because I just know running, how that affects me personally. And yeah, other sports I would play would be basketball. So I was in a basketball league, but that got canceled, unfortunately. So uh, I have a basketball net in the yard and just shoot hoops every night if I can. And yeah, but that's what I do pretty much like physical activity wise. I kind of love what I'm hearing here because a lot of it is just fitting exercise into everyday stuff. I mean, I know that we have been talking about triathlons as well, but it's also just, you know, walking, you know, playing, you know, shooting hoops out of the back garden. So I think that's one of the things we'll come back to is talking about 
that everyday exercise as well because for a lot of people that's what they want when it comes to diabetes management how do I take the dog for a walk around the park without having a hypo or something like that but Gary let's talk about what you see in clinic what do you hear from people with diabetes as being the main challenges and barriers when it comes to exercise and type 1 diabetes well I like what Kelsey said about you know a triathlon for someone with diabetes being a four sport event you got your run your cycle, your swim, your glucose control. And if they could grade us on that, I think that would be interesting. But that's the challenge, uh, preventing low blood sugars, preventing unusual rises in blood sugar with some forms of exercise. And it's, it's difficult because it's somewhat unpredictable. And there are some patterns that you can learn, but it doesn't always work. Sometimes the diabetes gods are just out to smite you and strange things happen. So you have to be able to think on your feet and make adjustments on the fly to keep yourself in range. Your performance in any sport or exercise for that matter hinges on, on having your glucose in a, in a healthy range. If it's too high, if it's too low, it's going to hinder your performance uh, and you're not going to get as much out of the workout. So that's, that's a lot of what I do with patients is work with them on, on managing their glucose optimally. Uh, so they can perform well in their chosen form of exercise. Yep, absolutely. So um, now Shane did mention COVID, but let's talk about that a little bit. What have you heard, Gary? Um, has COVID made exercise more difficult for people? Has it, you know, put up more barriers? What What have you found people's experience and your own experience as well? What What has COVID done? Well, I think like what Shane said, it it, it didn't necessarily keep people from being active. It just altered their experience a little bit. You know, in my case, I was used to going to the Y and, and like Shane, playing basketball a few nights a week, uh, using some of the cardio equipment, using the free weights. You know, I replaced my free weights at the gym with buckets of rocks and big pieces of concrete that I have in my basement. And I put a, a workout routine together using that stuff. And you know, my cardio is somewhat replaced by yard work now. So I've just been kicking it in the yard, doing all kinds of work out there. If you've ever tried to like dig out a tree stump, man, that's that's heavy labor. I mean, we were talking before about you know just you know, working up a good sweat. You get sweaty and incredibly dirty doing this kind of yard work, but it's a workout nonetheless. And I've gone through my share of, of Gatorade and Glucosade and other drinks like that, trying to keep my sugars afloat at the same time. And the th I'm sorry, I just need to get the seasons thing because we're just coming out of winter, obviously, here. but you guys have been in summer. Um, let's start, Kelsey, let's talk. So a couple of things. One, does the warmer weather make it more difficult or easier for you to exercise or doesn't have any impact at all um, was the first thing. But also, how have you had to change your um, training and exercise with COVID? Um, well, I would say right at the beginning, it wasn't too bad because you were going out and doing long bike rides and stuff. But um, the event that I was actually training for got cancelled at the end of May and I completely stopped doing everything. Um, so that was really tough because, um, you know, all of a sudden your diabetes is like, what are you doing? You know, let's go for a run kind of thing. Like, because it'd been nine months of training. So it was, you know, slowly getting back into it. But like you said, like with it being summer, like we're able to get on out on bike rides. And as long as you go early enough, there's not a lot of people around um, running when you can. Um, it's not too hot here during the summer. And um, unfortunately, our pools are closed as well. So, you know, that kind of takes that out of it. But um, there's always the ocean because um, you can swim in that. And yeah, I mean, it's it's more just the goal oriented, you know, I didn't have a goal. So that, that's what made it tough about exercising, but just getting out when you can and, um, you, you know, just keeping in your tiny little bubble that you have and having the support with that. Yeah. And Shane, what, what helped you to keep your motivation to, to be out there and to be moving, I guess, every day or every couple of days? I, I think, just like who I am as a person, I need to be doing something. So like, I feel like if I'm just sitting around, I'm not being productive throughout the day. So my motivation just comes from that. And I think like just working out is for me is the best way to do it, especially by going running. That's one of my favorite things to do. 
So I'll, again, like I'll try to go every morning and when I can, if I'm not busy and with like COVID, obviously like with the time off that we've had, like every morning's just been like, go for a 7am run, do that. And then just being like, Hey, I did something active today. And that just feels better than saying, Oh, I've been sitting around at home, I think in my opinion, but yeah. I think when it comes yeah, to absolutely exercise, one of the things that I, I was gonna say, I think Kelsey, Kelsey, say that again. doing exercise during COVID, even just a simple walk is good enough. <laughs> Sometimes I think you're right. But one of the things that I realized early on, so I've been working at home now for six months and um, I realized probably about two or three days in how much incidental exercise I do in an ordinary day and I wasn't doing that so I'd get to the end of the day and I would be um, quite achy like really like I felt you know really stiff in my back and um, so I started taking walks now I am loving these sorts of chats because I'm learning so much because I don't exercise you know the idea of doing a triathlon is quite possibly a nightmare for me um, but it, you know I, I realized I had to be doing something so going for walks and I've actually bought a spin bike because and just have it out on our deck so that I can actually but I have to say that when I, I've only told maybe three people told a few more now but only told three people about it and all of them asked for photographic evidence of me actually on the bike because they didn't believe that I was using it that's sort of my uh, exercise experience okay Gary let's talk about how we overcome some of these barriers though you know we know that they're there. What are some really good tips for people to actually get themselves moving and feeling confident that they can do that with their diabetes? Well, start slow. There's nothing that says you have to be an elite athlete right away. Uh, start slow. Find something that you enjoy. Uh, some people find walking relaxing. Some find it boring as all get up. If you find it boring, don't do it. Find something else to do. You, know, you can go play tennis. Find a partner to do something. You know, there's all kinds of things. Dance is a great form of exercise. So you know, anything you can do that's going to get your heart rate up for a while, uh, you know, be moderately challenging, uh, get your breathing pace up a little bit, you know, that, that's going to benefit you. That sort yeah. of activity is going to make your body more sensitive to insulin, uh, keep your blood vessels healthy, and help overcome some of the challenges that diabetes presents to our health. Yeah. So, I'd say, you know, find something you enjoy doing and, and just you know, do it for a half an hour straight or, or longer if you can. And, you know, make adjustments, though. That's the thing about diabetes. I, I think love what Kelsey said. It's like it's an extra it's an extra event. It's an extra job on top of everything else. But we're used to that. We always have to think in terms of what's this going to do to my blood sugar and what adjustments do I need to make for that? So, you know, if you're going to be active after a meal, clearly, if you have type 1, you're going to need to cut back on your meal dose of insulin. If you're working out other times of day, like in Shane's case, if he works out in the early morning, you can you may be able to cut back on basal insulin or just consume a little bit of rapid-acting carb before the activity to, to balance things out. I always think of this as a balancing act. You know, on one hand, you've got stuff raising your blood sugar, and the other hand is stuff lowering it, and you're trying to make everything balance out. So you got food and, and stress hormones here, and you got insulin and physical activity here. If you add physical activity, you either need less insulin, extra carbs, or I guess more stress to <laughs> balance it out. Absolutely. Um, okay. Now, don't, don't forget, if anybody has any questions, please, please do feel free to ask them and we will get around to them. But Gary, let's just go back. You did mention in there different types of exercise. So what are the specific benefits and challenges, I guess, of the different sorts of exercise? So, I mean, I, I, it's very different if you do just want to go for a slow walk down the street as compared with get ready and start preparing for something a little bit more intensive. So what, what are the different sorts of things that people need to consider depending on the type of exercise they're doing? Well, I mean, the, the longer and more intense the work, the more energy you burn, the greater your glucose is likely to come down and the more sensitive your body becomes to insulin. And then that effect can last for a while after the workout as well. But you know, we break most workouts into either uh, aerobic or anaerobic, or you know, cardio or strength, if you will. 
uh, you know, the cardio workouts are the traditional walking, cycling, swimming, running, stuff like that. These are activities that you do for an extended period of time at kind of a moderate intensity. Uh, and, and those will definitely you know, cause a decline in the blood glucose. Uh, the anaerobic activities are a bit trickier because sometimes those can cause glucose to decline. Other times it can go up because with anaerobic activity, you tend to also produce some adrenaline. And that can happen with competition. So in Kelsey, when you competed in a triathlon, I'm guessing that you went into that event and your blood sugar wasn't going down. It was probably going up. Yeah. What was it like <laughs> the day of the event? Yeah, I definitely, I start every race what I shouldn't be at. Um, mm -hmm. But I also know that it's gonna drop you know, pretty quick. I don't even correct for it. I don't give myself a dose of insulin because I know for sure it's going down. Mm. Um, I always just call that adrenaline high because it's like literally a high. Um, but yeah, like it's without, like I know my body knows that it's going to be race day and all of a sudden you wake up and the blood sugar's in the teens and you're like, oh, here it comes. Like, it just knows. So um, even though if I prep for it, I could, you know, give myself a little bit more insulin or eat a little bit less, it still does it. So I just know that it's coming and just be prepared for it. Adrenaline's a funny thing and it's hard to predict sometimes. I know Shane with basketball, if I'm playing in a kind of a relaxed game and the guys are just having fun, my sugar will usually trend down quite a bit. But if I'm getting into a really competitive game where guys are yelling and fighting and arguing, it really spikes me up. You ever see that happen? Yeah, so I think there's always, like, a little bit of difference. Like, if it's, like, me and my friends playing, I tend to go more lower because, again, it, like you said, it's more relaxed. But before I played in a league, right, and it, I would notice that during, like, the heat of the game, it, I would just, like, spike at a certain point and it would just be, like, I would, I would give, like, a small treatment, like, nothing too crazy because I didn't want to risk going low, but yeah like i would notice that when they're like competing and like there's all that adrenaline like i would be going high yeah. there have been some basketball players in the nba with type 1 diabetes adam morrison who went to gonzaga and uh there's a guy named uh forbes i forgot his first name but he played for the toronto raptors for a while uh i guess it was back about 10 or 15 years ago you know, and I've read interviews that you know, they've conducted and you know, a lot of the challenges they face. But we've got athletes with type 1 diabetes in every sport out there, men's and women's sports at all different levels. Uh, I think everybody can benefit from thinking them, of themselves as an athlete in training. Even if they're just training to be able to walk for 20 minutes without collapsing, they're still an athlete in training. And I think it's a mindset that's a healthy thing. I've got a mindset that says I'm an active person. I'm going to get a workout in every day. I'm going to figure out a way to do it. If today, I'm not going to get home till very late. I'm going to do a late workout. But you know, just working it into your schedule. I, I, I talk to people about looking at their schedule a week at a time and figuring out where they're going to plug those workouts in. And sometimes the workout has to be part of just their lifestyle and chores that they have to do or things they have to be responsible for. So if they have to watch the kids or they have to go shopping, make a workout out of it. If they have to mow, you know, take care of their yard, make a workout. If they have to clean, make a workout out of that. You can just take ordinary daily activities and turn that into an exercise session. Yeah, that's, that's such great advice. And I think that that makes it less daunting for people as well. If you think that you've got to add something else that's just going to add extra bulk and weight to an already frantic lifestyle, there are always... That makes it a lot easier to avoid it. Yeah. Okay, we have a question. Um, Gary, I'm going to go to you for this one. Do you have any tips on how to prevent lows at night after an active day? So perhaps we can talk, let's start by explaining why we might be low, you know, some time after we've done our exercise and then um, perhaps some advice around um, how to prevent that. And then um, Kelsey and Shane, we'll talk, we'll ask, I'll ask you about your experiences with that too. Well, I, I just got off a call with a patient who's a, a teenage boy who's on a cross-country team, so he does a lot of running. And we looked at his data, and we found that when he had long practices, late afternoon, two-hour practices, 
this is what would happen to him. His glucose would decline overnight. When he doesn't have those long practices, he rocks steady through the night. So knowing that and being able to predict this drop, we have strategies for preventing it. If he's on a pump, that's one of the major advantages of using a pump is that you can temporarily reduce your basal insulin following these workouts that, that cause a drop. It's hard to do that with injections. And he happens to use, I think, Traceba, which lasts for like some ungodly 30, 36 hours. I said, you know, if you cut your Traceba dose, you're going to muck up your control for the next two days. So he's going to use a slow burning snack at night. In his case, he loves chocolate milk. So he's going to have some chocolate milk before bed uh, and not, to, not dose for it. So provide some slow burning fuel through the night to prevent those drops. He's only going to need it following the workouts that cause those kind of drops. Any form of exercise can improve insulin sensitivity, but it's the ones that are really exhausting that deplete the glycogen stores in our muscles. And those are the ones that lead to the more significant declines in the blood sugar later on. So I think it's everyone's job to, to review their own history look and keep a workout log and see what, are, what do my blood sugars do during this activity and also what happens later? Am I getting a delayed drop or a delayed rise? That happens to some people also. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Shane, can you tell me, is this something that you find that you need to be thinking about? Is these later, you know, nighttime or early morning or next day lows? Yeah, so I would say, again, it really did depend on like what I'd be doing, but like when I was doing like my basketball league, I would have it at night around seven you know and like i would i would go spike then like i would give a little bit of treatment but then i would notice i would go low right so then with that just like i treated like i regularly would but when like i'm doing things like running i i have to put a temp basal on i usually do 30 percent decrease again that works for me but that's also something i discussed with my endo team yes. and it's something that i found they said start off at 30 see what it see what it does for you and if it's too much cut back to 20 but if it's not enough go to the 40 percent cut and i think just being on a pump that's really beneficial in a way because you can just do that with the basil yeah yeah, um, Kelsey, what about you? Is this something, especially I guess with your um, with your triathlons, is this something that you need to factor in what, in your recovery period? For sure, and like Shane said, like the temp basil really helps with that. Um, I was finding that I was doing a lot of my swims in the evening because of adult swims, so you can get the lane by yourself. It was at nine o'clock at night, so you'd be going for about an hour or two, but during the swim, you turn down your, you know, you have a temp basil raid and. Um, you get home and you might be a little bit, you know, have some high blood sugar. And I would find that, you know, it did take some time to get getting used to. There was like, you know, you'd wake up at three in the morning just to test to see what it was at. And, um, you know, a couple months down the road, you're like, okay, I figured it out and I'll maybe have a snack before a bit if you're finding that you're below a certain number. So I was finding on those nights that I was being active. If I was below eight, I would always have just a little granola bar or something to kind of get me through the night. Um, but if it was anything above that, it was, it was pretty good through the night. Yeah. Okay. The really nice thing about the new hybrid closed loop systems is to a certain extent, they'll take care of that for a patient and yeah. you know, things like you know, the Medtronic, uh, hybrid closed loop, the 670 and the do it yourself systems. And here in the States, we have a, another pump called tandem that has a hybrid closed loop. So these systems will detect a, a decline and, start pairing back the basal insulin for the user automatically. So overnight, you don't have to worry nearly as much about these, these delayed drops when using a system like that. I think that that sort of automation just, I mean, it makes so much about diabetes so much easier. And um, it, it's, it's truly remarkable. I mean, even, you know, obviously with exercise, but just day to day stuff that's not exercise related. It's, it's one of, I think, um, the biggest things that I've seen in diabetes in the 22 years that I've had it that truly does make diabetes 
you know, living with diabetes easier. And we all want that. All right. We've been really focusing on benefits around blood glucose levels and how we manage that. But let's shift this a little bit because exercise is about more than that. It's also about well-being, right? So I know a lot of people say if they are not getting out and moving every day or every couple of days, it really affects their well-being. It affects their mood. It affects how they're feeling about themselves. Can we talk a little bit about that, if that's okay? Kelsey, would you like to start? Is this something that you found? Does exercise and being active help how you feel? For sure. Yeah, it definitely makes you feel good. Um, Obviously, putting the shoes on is the hardest thing, but getting out and, you know, when you're out there and by the time you get home, it, you know, it's it's definitely worth it. Um, I know that when I stopped training for the Ironman, um, it took a while to get back into it. Um, Motivation was very low, everything like that. But as soon as, you know, there's these little groups that you can join doing online exercise and stuff like that. And like you said, go slow. It just, it helps with, just those daily kind of getting through the day and everything like that. So yeah. it means a lot. Yeah, that's great. Shane, what about you? Do you find that it helps your well-being? Yeah, I definitely think it does. I feel like if I skip um, an exercise, I, at the end of the day, I just feel sluggish. Like, I feel like I'm not tired, but I don't feel proper in a way. So I think just like, again, like we said, like putting on the shoes is the hard part. And when I go running, it's, I don't, I, at the beginning, I don't like it. But once I know I've hit my halfway point, I'm like, yeah, like this feels really good right now. And like working up that sweat, I think it's just, you want to get there. I feel like it, it's a good feeling to do. Like, even if you, even if you don't like running, I didn't used to like running, but like the more you keep doing it and like, once you set goals for yourself, it, it, it almost feels like a reward. Yeah. Uh, we're going to talk about goals a little later because I think that's something really important. But Gary, talk to us about what, why do we feel allegedly, why do we feel better when we exercise? I'm, I'm, I'm still getting to that point, but tell us about why activity makes us, you know, feel I better so you know, overall. I know when I, when I do whatever form of workout I'm going to do, I'm not thinking about work. I'm not thinking about issues with my kids or money or my, my diabetes. I'm just into that workout. I'm able to focus. I kind of get into a zone. I, I, Kelsey and Sam, I see you nodding your head so you know what I'm talking about. When you get into that zone, it, it's, it's a, the greatest form of escape. That, I think, feels great. But I can really relate to what Shane said, too, because the days I miss a workout, I, I am just sluggish. I got, man, the energy level just kind of drops the next day. So I know if I get that workout in, but like Kelsey said, you got to put the shoes on. Helps put some shorts on, too, but you, know, you got you to gotta do it. Sometimes you just got to force yourself knowing you're going to feel better. It's what you need. And, 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 again, doing things you like. I think that really does help. Um, I love playing basketball. It's fun. You know, running to me, and I know, Shane, you love running, but I don't love running. I know it, it's, it's a great way to work out, though. So I make it fun for myself. I get on a treadmill when there's a good ball game on TV, and I can watch it while I'm running. Or I'll have a, a show that I really want to watch, and I'll record it and watch it while I'm on the treadmill. Uh, so, yeah. Finding ways to make it fun for yourself or be productive while you're doing it. Like my yard's coming along pretty nice. <laughs> Honestly, you could make a workout just out of cleaning the windows in your house. Yes. You'll have beautiful windows by the time your workout's over. So. Yeah. Vacuuming sends me low without like, so I don't vacuum. Is that, is that the right is that the right? Because, okay, because I've done something for the UK. They hoover. Okay, I have a question here from somebody um, who says, so this is, so let's just talk generally here. So we don't, you know, um, please, again, this is one of those questions that it will be different for everybody. But here's some general advice. Gary, I'll throw this to you. Um, when do you start to decrease your basils? Is it an hour before exercise? Is it just the duration of the exercise? And how long after exercise? So what sort of things do people need to be thinking about when they're working that out? Because that will be different for everybody, right? Yeah, this, this is one of my kind of 
novel areas of diabetes I do a lot of work with. Basal insulin adjustments can be useful uh, with long-term activities. They're not as useful for short-term bouts of exercise. When you reduce your basal insulin, you're changing your basal for the next at least four hours. Even if you only change your basal for an hour, the effects of that are spread out over the next three, four hours. So if you want to reduce your insulin just during a 40-minute workout, you can't do that. It's going to be spread way beyond that. So for the most part, we teach our patients to make basal adjustments for prolonged activities, long bouts of yard work, housework, uh, endurance events where they're out for several hours doing things. For the short-term activities, we don't tend to touch the basals nearly as much. But if you, the timing is also critical. When you're going to adjust basal, the adjustment has to be made at least an hour beforehand. And, and that's just because of the, the crappy nature of the insulin we're using. It, it's so slow and, and it takes so long to work. When our body makes insulin, it, it works in seconds. The, the insulin we take through our pumps or injections takes hours to work. So to get the insulin lower and, and when your workout starts, you've got to start the adjustment way ahead of time. And you know, the, the magnitude of the adjustment matters as well. You know, there's been some research on this. Cutting the basal 50% is pretty standard prior to a workout, but blood sugars can still drop a fair amount, especially if you're doing an activity that burns quite a bit of energy. You may have to cut the basal 70 or 80% to really achieve a more stable glucose with, with, with more uh, rigorous kinds of workouts. So let's just, I've got another question here about um, overnight hypos, but specifically this is um, any advice or suggestions on slow burning snacks. Do we have some favorites? You did mention the chocolate milk before bed, um, mm -hmm. but are there any others that people want to, to volunteer what might work? Yeah, Gary? Nuts. Are very Nuts. Good. Peanuts. Okay. All right. Yep. Kelsey, Shane, is there anything in there that, that you have tried that works especially well? Peanut butter and bananas. <laughs> peanut butter on together <laughs> yeah oh okay hmm. all right Shane yeah Gary said what I wanted to say nuts for sure I've also tried a like a granola bar that okay. that seemed to work for me at least but yeah. most of the time it's nuts or a granola bar are there any nuts in particular that work better or is it just whatever you prefer um <laughs> Sorry, say that again, Gary? Peanuts are, are a pretty good choice. They've got okay. a, a little bit of carb in them. Other, some other nuts are really have, have hardly any carbohydrate. Okay. Shane, what about for you? Um, I've, I've like, I don't know if I'm assuming Gary and Kelsey would know what it is, but I used to go to like bulk barn and get like a mix of nuts. So it, I, okay. yeah, I would just mix of the nut section. Yep. Shane's nut mix. Okay. Great. Yeah. Dairy products. Nut, yeah. Full fat ice cream is also going to work pretty well. You know, get the good stuff. Get the Hagen Dazs, you know, things yeah. like that. The Ben and Jerry's. You know, don't get the low fat version. You need the full fat version to get that slow action. Yeah, wonderful. Now, we have got five minutes to go, and um, I think that uh, in that time, so if there are any um, last-minute questions, please do add them. Um, but I have a question. A couple, we've mentioned goals, and I think that this is a really important thing um, because we want things that are achievable because we don't want to feel that we are, you know, failing, which is such a terrible word to use when it comes to anything to do with diabetes. So how do you go about setting goals that, um, that, you know, that are achievable for people or for yourself? Now consider what you're doing currently and set a goal that would be an improvement over what you're doing now. Uh, yep. Call these smart goals, so it's got to be specific. So if you get some physical activity in one day a week now, be specific. All right, I'm going to get some activity three days a week now. That's measurable. It's realistic. You know, you're not saying I'm going to go from being inactive to being, you know, 
captain activity every day I'm getting exercise and it's probably not realistic. So make it something that's achievable and measurable. Uh, I think that's the best way to do it. And I, I would consider, you know, getting some advice from, from your healthcare team as well. If not your doctor, then, you know, talk to your diabetes educator or diabetes specialist for some input on that. Uh, we, we're pretty good at helping people develop these reasonable goals. Um, okay, now I have a question here that somebody's asked about super starch products and their use in type 1 diabetes. This isn't a term that makes any sense to me, but perhaps, Gary, is this something that, that you can advise on as a way to prevent lows specifically? Super starch. Never super heard. starch. Mm. There is something okay. called uh, uncooked corn starch that's been used in some, like, so there was a product called Night Bite years ago. It was a very slow digesting. But uncooked corn starch is a form of carb that's very slow to break down. You don't need anything like that. Chocolate will do the same thing. Uh, you know, you okay. get you know, at M&Ms, you get a nice slow, slow burn from stuff like that. Yep. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Now we are about to wrap up. So I am going to throw it open to everybody for some last minute tips and tricks. So it's whatever you would like to say. Um, I guess it's either a tip about, you know, getting started with exercise or things to think about or words of wisdom that people have shared with you that have really, really helped. Um, okay, let's um, see. Shane, let's start with you. Yeah, I think like a major tip that I would suggest is I have a calendar, right? And I try to put like a red dot on the days I've worked out. And that helps me also set a goal because I try to aim for four days a week, right? And I think if you have that visual reminder, it, it feels good. And you're like, oh, hey, I did do my workouts this week. So that would be like my tip. I do that too. Uh, Mine's a star. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone go and buy an elephant stamp and use that. I like that idea as well. That's a really good and easy tip. I love those sorts of things. Kelsey, what can you share with us? Um, I would definitely say planning, you know, planning and goal setting, um, not too far in advance because what we've learned is yep. get cancelled. So, you know, week, week by week, it's kind of what you just have to get through and survive that week and then move on to the next one. Every Sunday, sit down, write in your planner what you're going to do for the week and, you know, try and match those goals and maybe make a big goal, but for the end, um, you know, like it's just knowing your body, planning, being prepared, um, definitely just writing things down when you can and, stuff like that. Yep. I, I really like all this. I mean, it's, none of this is really rocket science, is it? It's just about, you know, keeping yourself accountable. But I do want to ask, what if you're not making those goals? How do you overcome that and not just throw the towel in and say, you know what, this is too hard, I'm not doing it. What do you do? Is it just a matter of picking it up and resetting the clock and starting again or, or resetting your goals? What sort of things would you do around that? I'll ask you, Kelsey, seeing that just following on from what you were saying. Sure. Um, just put your shoes on, see where it takes you. You know what I mean? Like you don't need to yeah. go for a 10K run if it's written down and allow yourself to have those off days. Allow yourself to have, you know, those, those bad sugars and stuff like that because that's what you're going to learn from. You're going to learn, you know, what you need to eat and stuff and you just have to do it. Go once and you, you know, you just keep going. So, um, yeah, it's acceptable. Yeah. Right. <laughs> that's super good. And Gary, let's finish up with you. Thank you. So, just some tips for getting started and, and keeping going as well. Well, the, the number one reason, and there's been multiple research studies that have proven this, the number one reason people with diabetes either don't exercise or stop is due to fear of hypoglycemia. And there is absolutely nothing you can't do. You can do any activity and avoid, hype, avoid low blood sugar. You just have to plan for it. Like Kelsey was saying, you, you got to think ahead. We got to plan these things out. But you can do anything and you can still, you can prevent the low blood sugars. If you know the kind of adjustments to make, it's absolutely doable. And if your current healthcare team is not giving you the guidance to, to do that, look elsewhere. You know, there are people out there who are very good at this and can coach you on how to do it successfully. 
Wonderful. Okay. Thank you to all of you so, so much. I think I've loved hearing everything you've said. I've loved the personal experiences and Gary adding all the clinical stuff on top of that. I feel that we've had a really wonderful picture of how we can be active and get moving and, and manage our diabetes with that. So thank you to everybody as well who has been watching. Um, I hope that you're taking away lots of ideas and, and where to go next with this. Um, and next session is in two weeks' time or a fortnight mm -hmm. if you're in Australia. Um, fortnight. Um, and it's all about, you know, eating out and, and eating at home. And especially now with restrictions, you know, we can't eat out as, uh, out as much. How do we deal with uh, cooking and eating at home? So we've got Deborah Sloan and Nicole Marcelin joining us in two weeks' time. I really hope to see many of you there again. I know, Gary, you're coming back and doing another session at another time, so we'll look forward to that. But thank you very, very much to everybody. And one of the wonderful Ipsomed Canada team now is going to end this. So we will all say bye-bye. See you later.